So you guys are in for a real treat today. Tom Lundstedt is one of America's most popular speakers on the topics of investment in real estate and taxation. He has spoken before more than 3,000 audiences from coast to coast. I've actually heard him before. Um, if it was for a national franchise. Um, besides speaking about investment real estate and tax, Tom practices what he preaches. He began buying investment real estate as a very young man and continues to build his personal portfolio of rental properties throughout the USA. In another life, he was a catcher for the Chicago Cubs and Minnesota Twins. Let's go Yankees. Uh, <laughs> Please okay. help me welcome Tom Lundstedt. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. How many of you here because you really want to learn something? Do you agree as long as we're going to put in the time, we might as well put in the time, have some fun, and learn something we can use? Yes? yes. I guarantee that's going to happen. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about wealth. We're going to talk about taxes. And people think, oh, man, that sounds terrible. No, it's great. Do you agree there's a big difference between earning a living and building wealth? Those are two different activities, aren't they? And two different, if you think about it, pretty much unrelated activities. How many of you know somebody earns a really good living and has no wealth? Or how many of you know somebody who's earned a good living for years and years and years and has no wealth? It's sad, it's sad. And real estate people are notorious for earning a lot of money and having no wealth. And you can recognize these people a mile away. These are the ones who come up and say, I remember when I could have bought that property over there for $5,000, and now it's a zillion. And the one over there, all I had to do is pay the back taxes, and now there's a shopping mall on it. Well, shut up. Uh, you know, it doesn't do any good to talk about it. We've got to do it, and so few people, few people do anything. Do you agree with me? Americans are absolutely ignorant when it comes to tax and financial matters. Yeah. Absolutely, completely. 100% ignorant. How many of you ever heard people say something like this? I'll tell you, these taxes are so bad, I can't afford to get a raise. Really, I can't afford to work overtime. I'll tell you that right now. If I work overtime, it'll bump me in a higher tax bracket, I'll get wiped out. How many of you heard people say they don't want to earn more money? What do you think of that? Well, that's stupid. Uh, never, never is earning another dollar going to cost us more than a dollar in tax. We'd have to be in what tax bracket for that to happen? 100%, we don't have that yet, but I know you've heard people say they don't want to earn more money. Here's the first rule of the afternoon. I'll be with you for 90 minutes straight. Here's the foundation upon which my whole presentation is built. You don't have to write it down. Here's the building block. Income is good. <laughs> tax sheltered income is better. Tax free income is best of all. And we need to realize that that we in the real estate business are in the business of providing tax sheltered and tax free income to people. Our dollars are better than their dollars. And we as an industry ought to be shouting this from the rooftops, and yet we don't. We don't use one of the most powerful uh, tools that we have. And I want to show you some ideas that might just help your already successful business be a little bit more uh, successful. How many of you own any investment real estate? Do you know across the country, out of every 100 people with a real estate license in America, how many would you guess own investment real estate of any type? From a rental house to a big shopping center, what would you guess? Out of every 100 people with a real estate license? Four. Four out of 100 people with a real estate license own any investment real estate. We can't even sell it to ourselves, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, let alone anybody. Now, how many of you know somebody who owns it who wish they'd never seen it before? How many of you know somebody who owns it who, in their heart of hearts, if they admitted it, would admit they didn't know what they were doing when they bought this stuff? And what if I didn't know what I was doing and I bought a rental property and I lost my shirt? Do I typically blame myself for that? No. Oh, oh. Who gets the blame for that? Yeah, the realtor who sold it to me. Yeah. And so we need to analyze the property when? Before we buy the property. Before we list the property. How many of you know people in the real estate business who've taken a listing on an investment property without having a clue what they were doing? And is, is investment real estate different than residential? Not better, not worse, just different. It's a different set of skills. And you see, the problem is we all have a license that says we are experts in all manner of real estate. But do you agree a license did not, does not necessarily confer expertise? Right? And so how many of you would like to be really good at this investment and tax stuff? And there are people who are looking for realtors who understand this. And I get, I get, I get two or three phone calls a week in my office. I live, I live on an island in Wisconsin, Lake Michigan, a little island sticking up way above Green Bay. Little, uh, 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 151 people. I don't know, 150 people. Larry died. Uh, and, <laughs> A little tiny. It adds, it adds a degree of difficulty to my travel. The nearest stoplight to my home is 42 miles. 
and, 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 but I travel a lot. Like to get here, I left three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, and I'm done at five o'clock. I promise to be home by uh, Thanksgiving, but it's worth it. It's worth it to be with all of uh, you. Let's talk a little bit about rental property. Uh, no baloney, we, got, we don't have that much time uh, here. Uh, think about this, we need to analyze the property before we buy it. I don't, I don't think anybody can argue with that. Well, the problem is uh, people just aren't sure how it works. And so let's talk about maybe some ideas how to explain some of this stu stuff to people. Think of a rental property as a money machine with three parts. Turn, you got a little handout, turn in your handout to page uh, two. Page two, second page in. Uh, three parts, think, now here, here's where, here's what I don't want you to do. I do not want you to sit there and think, oh, those numbers wouldn't be right in our town, or that rent, that's not even close in our town. That price, I don't care. I'm not coming from a little island in Lake Michigan to the big city to tell you I know your markets better than you. I don't, but I want to show you how this works. Once you know how this works, can you apply it any town USA? Big property, small property, a single family rental house or a big shopping mall? The concept is exactly the same. Think of a rental property, whether it's a rental house or a, a shopping center, a three, as a money machine with three parts. What are the parts? Come on, talk to me, what are the parts? All right, income, benefit number one, or, or income. Part number one is income. We need to know the income. What else, what else, what else? Are you taking my picture? All right, wait, I, I, got, I got a second in my stomach. Do it again, quick, quick. <laughs> All right, what's the second? Wait, wait, wait. What's the second part? Second. All right, expenses. Beautiful. What's the third? Financing. Income, expenses, and financing. Every rental property is a money machine with income, expenses, and financing. Whether it's a rental house or a big shopping center, you would not buy a rental property without knowing how many of those parts. All three. How many of them are important? All three. If you change one of them, what happens to the whole property? It changes, the value changes. Now, once you know the three parts of the machine, then you can go over and flip the on switch on that money machine and turn it on and it'll produce four financial benefits. What are they? Income. First, all right, income. It's called income property, kids. There ought to be some income there. And all investment real estate has income. It's just not always what? Positive, Positive income, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, now, what, what, what do we call this? We, we, don't, we have our own language, we in the real estate business. We don't call it income, what do we call that? Cash flow. Cash flow, two more words, cash flow, CFBT. Cash flow, BT, what's the BT? Before tax, before income tax we're talking there. All right, so we got some income, some cash flow. What else, what else? Well, appreciation, I heard somebody say, call it number four. Appreciation, the property might go up in value over the years. Not overnight, but over the years. One of the nice things about real estate is it's a relatively stable investment, relatively stable. It typically doesn't spike up and spike down overnight. In the stock market, you could lose your money overnight, yes? yes. Where in real estate, it takes you months. Uh, so it's good, <laughs> it's low, it's low. What else, what else? Tax savings, I heard somebody say, call it number three, income tax savings. Owning the property might save us some income tax. What creates the income tax savings? Depreciation, Depreciation which is what kind of expense? Non-cash, it's just accounting, it's not real money. Tax deductions are good, yes? yes. Non-cash deductions are yes. great, because I get to deduct them, I just don't have to pay them. And you know what, I bet there isn't one person in this room who's depreciating their property correctly. It, well, there's one, and, and, and I, I, don't, I don't mean you're doing something illegal, I mean you're not depreciating to your maximum benefit. I see money lying on the floor all over this room. We're gonna bend over, pick it up, and put it in your pocket by the time we're done. How about the second benefit? Second benefit, a little more subtle. It always gets kind of shuffled off to the side, but it's a powerful benefit. What's happening? What is it? Yeah, what's happening to the loan? The loan's being paid down by whom? The tenants, I hope, I hope, principal reduction, PAL, principal reduction, let's call it. The loan's being paid down by the tenants. Somebody else is buying you that uh, property. How many of you work with first time home buyers, people who are renting? If you know somebody who's renting, wouldn't you look them right in the eye and say, when did you decide to buy a building? They'll say, no, 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 we haven't decided to buy, we are renting. And you have to say to them what? Say, no, 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 you're buying the building. You're just buying it for Somebody, isn't that true? I'm not being a smart aleck. No matter where we live, we're buying a building. It's just a question of for whom. How many of you in this room 
can think of a real person, a real human being, who's rented the same house for 20 years. Look, 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 look at all this. Have they not paid for Everybody in this room is going to buy three or four houses in their lifetime. It's just a question of for whom. All right. So three parts of the money machine. What are they? Don't look in your notes. Income. Don't look at I see you going like this. So I see you going like this. What are they? Income, expenses, and financing. We need to know all three of those before we can proceed. Once we know the income, the expenses, and the financing, then we can flip the on switch and it'll produce four financial benefits. What are they? I see you looking at it. I see you looking at it. Cash flow, print reduction, tax savings, appreciation. All right. And we want to estimate these things when? Before we list the property, before we buy the property. Yeah. And then we'll talk about maybe some other times to do it too. Now, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a one page worksheet that allowed us to do this all on one page? Wouldn't that be something? It's like a miracle. Look at page three. And on page three, you have uh, one of six worksheets that I developed for real estate people. And this is a terrific worksheet to analyze a property before you buy, before you list the property. The top half of this worksheet is uh, uh, the money, the parts of the money machine, income, expenses, the financing. The middle portion, room number one, two, three, four, there are those four financial benefits that we talked about. And then down at the bottom are some various rates of return. Now, I want to try an example. Let's fill one out together. And I want to show you how this works. Now, here's where don't key in on my numbers, key in on the concept. And then you can apply this to your town, your own particular market. Now, on yours, look at the, the little paragraph at the top. I've edited it out up here for space on the screen. But look at that paragraph. It's, this form is designed to estimate the first year benefits. Circle first year. If you're analyzing a rental property, what year's numbers are most meaningful to you? The first year, these are the numbers we can see. The farther out into the future you try to project the numbers, what happens? Foggy. How far into the real estate future can you see? Me too. Not very far. What's the real estate market going to be like a year from now, or five years from now, or ten years from now? I don't know. You don't know either. And yet, don't you see people do projections on real estate? In CCIM, I got my CCIM 20 years ago. In CCIM, we did five-year projections and 10-year projections with an internal rate of return. If you're a commercial appraiser, you know that you're sometimes required to do a five-year projection with an internal rate of return. In my opinion, it's just my opinion. You can take those projections and flush them because they're only as good as what? Well, the assumptions you make. Could you make any stinky deal look good? Yeah. You want, if you make goofy enough assumptions, you want a 28% internal rate of return? I'll get you a 28% internal rate of return. I'll just assume this. And if you don't believe me, look at the 10 year projections you made on real estate 10 years ago and tell me how you did. You'll throw those away so fast you won't believe it. I had a guy not long ago send me to my office on the island a 15 year projection on a shopping center. 15 years. The thing was like three and a half inches thick. It weighed 30 pounds. It landed on my desk with a thud. He sent it FedEx. It probably cost him 50 bucks. And I opened it up and it's a 15 year projection. I called him up and I said, 15 year projection? Who are you, the amazing Kreskin? Uh, what's the world going to be like in 15 years? And you know what he admitted? He just got new computer software that does projection. <laughs> he was all excited. He said, it'll do 25 years. You want one of those? No, uh, no, no. First year. Now, I want to try one. I got a phone call from a, a, a lady who was thinking about buying a little apartment building in her town, and she wanted to know if I thought it was a good deal. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I think, but I'm going to show you the numbers on it, and I'm going to ask you what you uh, think. So fill this in with me now. $390,000 was the purchase cost. $390,000. Now, is that a good deal? Yes. Is there enough information up there to tell if that's a good deal? No, if you can tell if that's a good deal from that, I'll go to your seminar. Uh, no, no, whoa. What would you want to know? What would you want to know? What's the first thing you'd want to know? Carol, you're thinking about buying uh, what, income. Yeah, but you want to know the income, but the first thing, what's the first thing? With location, yeah, you got to be able to find it. But the first, 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 first. How about the terms? Does it matter if it's 390,000 cash or 390,000 a dollar a year for 390,000 years? Right, that would be two extremes, wouldn't it? Well, this one is available, 84,000 cash invested. 84,000 cash invested, she has to finance the remaining 306. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the interest rate on that financing affect the value of that property? 
sure does, doesn't it? The greater the interest rate, the more money it takes for Carol to service the debt, the less money that's available for her. So the financing is absolutely critical. Would you believe and agree with this statement? I haven't said it yet. But, uh, <laughs> would you agree and believe this statement? A good property with bad financing is a bad investment. A mediocre property with good financing can be a good investment. The financing, absolutely critical. Well, this financing happens to be all owner financing. This is a real property. The owner is an old man. He's 50, and he's owned this property a long time. No, he's owned it a long time, and he absolutely refuses to cash out. And he wants to finance his geezerhood by carrying back the note. And he'll carry back the note, Carol, with no balloon payment. He'll string it out till it's paid. But in return for that interest rate risk that he would be taking, he wants a high interest rate. So he's offering this. 306 at 7% interest. Now you could do better than this going to the bank, but you can't go to the bank on this one. No deal. All right, and so the payments on that would be, uh, what is it, $2,036 a month. 2,036 times 12 is 24,432 in debt service, we call that debt service. Just fancy words for principal and interest. That's exactly how that property is for sale. Now here's Carol, let's say she's got the 84,000, she wants to invest in real estate, but she's not sure whether she wants to buy this property, the one across the street, or the one around the corner over there. She wants to now uh, uh, estimate her benefits. In order to do that, she has to know how many parts of the machine? Three. All three. How many parts do we know? One. We know the financing. So now what would you want to know, Evelyn? You said it before. Or Carol, you said it. For income. Yeah. Income. What if I was a seller and Carol said, hey, Tom, what's your income? Well, what does that mean? What if I say to you, hey, what's your income? What does that mean? Does it mean gross? Does it mean net? It means gross. Do, well, those of you who are looking at me like, I don't know. You're right. I don't know either. You, 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 can't, you can't just say to somebody, what's your income? Nobody knows what that means, what's your income. We're going to see here on a, on a rental property, there are four different types of income. And if Carol, if Carol says, hey, Tom, what's your income? Could I think she means, what's my income? When she really means, what's my income? <laughs> when the most important thing of all is, what's my what? Income. income. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got to be more specific. Well, look at a few lines down. You see it says, the annual rent. The annual rent is the total possible income on this property. The annual rent on this property, the, the annual rent is how, the rent, the, how much you'd collect if every unit in the building was rented every day of the year at full price. It includes apartment rents, garage rents, washer, dryer income, pop machine. P Do you say pop? Are you pop? Not soda. You're not soda. Get out. All right, well, this would be the pop machine or the soda machine. No matter, you know what they call it in New Mexico? Coke. No matter what, you have lunch, no, I'm not kidding. You have lunch at a restaurant, you say to the waitress, I'd like a tuna fish sandwich, please. Waitress says, oh, would you like a Coke with it? Yes, what kind? Uh, seven up. <laughs> well, so anyway, the total possible income, $59,700. Now, that's the total possible income. What are the odds that property is gonna be rented every day of the year at full price? Well, it's not impossible, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely. I know this is unbelievable, folks, but sometimes there's no tenants. And we need to make an adjustment for that. This is even more unbelievable. Sometimes even if there's tenants. <laughs> yes, you're way ahead of me. There's no rent. Just because you got tenants doesn't mean you got rent. So we need to make an adjustment here for vacancy and credit losses. Well, what are vacancy rates today? You don't even answer. It's a stupid question. You say, Tom, it's a stupid question. It is a stupid question. There's no such thing as a vacancy rate. It would depend on what? What town you're in, what rents you're asking, what kind of property. Uh, could you have four corners, a farm building, shopping center, office building, rental house? Could they all have completely different vacancies? They're completely different products. Could you have a different vacancy inside your own apartment building on your three-bedroom apartments versus your one-bedroom apartments? So you'd have to study the market a little bit. In this case, let's use 5%. Let's take 5% out of there, Carol. If you get any of that money, if Carol gets any of that money, that'd be a bonus. Let's not count on it. So we take that away. She's left with $56,715. And we call that 5617 her gross operating income, G-O-I. Now, if you're not used to using these words, don't worry. We'll use these words over and over. Uh, what is gross operating income? I mean, put in words a baseball player. I don't understand gross operating income. I couldn't even figure my own batting average. Or my batting average, you could figure in my head, but not those guys who could hit. You know what my lifetime major league batting average is? Just take a guess. Not 200. Lifetime major league batting average, 311. If you add it up. 
uh, which, which is how I figured. I hit 100 three years in a row. Adds up to 311. <laughs> well, how else would you do it? Now, wait, wait. What is this 56715? This is what Carol actually takes into her checkbook. She doesn't take in the 57 something, or 597. She takes in 56715. Now, if that's true, should she, Carol, immediately go book a $56,715 cruise around the world based on her profit from this little business? Might that be a little premature, eh? Because now what's she got to pay? She's got to run the business. She's got to operate the business. So the operating expenses. So we, we know the income. We know the financing. We need to know the operating expenses. Look at the next line down. Doesn't it make sense? We need to know the operating expenses. That's fairly obvious, and yet as obvious as that is, how many of you ever dealt with or talked with people who value buildings based on how many times the gross income the cost is? Have you ever heard people say, I pay six times gross or seven times gross? What they're saying is that cost is seven times the gross income, and that's how some people value buildings. What do you think of that method of valuing a building? Good method, bad method? Stinks would be a word that comes to mind. Uh, is it simple? It's simple, therefore popular, but could you lose your shirt buying real estate that could you lose your entire wardrobe buying real estate that way? What's the problem with that? What if I said, Carol, come on, I'll sell you the property for seven times the gross income. I forgot to tell you the expenses are what? For well, 10 times, I was gonna say eight. Moses says 10 times, yeah. Well, so we need to take into account the five. And you know that gross multiplier, please don't fall into the trap of using that. Uh, and you, the gross multiplier method knows it's a bad method. It knows it's bad. So you know what it does, don't you? It tries to disguise itself. It does, it does. Here's one of the disguises that it takes on. How many of you ever heard that a rental property ought to rent for a certain percent of its value a month? You ever heard some kind of rule of thumb? What number to use? Uh, 1%, so a $100,000 house ought to rent for $1,000 a month. You ever heard some kind of rule of thumb like that? That's a bunch of baloney. You know what that is, don't you? That's the gross multiplier in disguise. <laughs> and so Carol says, I'm not falling for that. She wants to know the operating expenses. Well, here they are. Uh, things like utilities, insurance, repairs and maintenance, management, property tax, all those things are operating expenses. Now, we're not gonna th go through line by line, but let me just give you the total. The total operating expense on this property, remember I said this is a real building, 20, is 26,650. That's the total operating expenses. Now, two things I wanna say here. One is if a broker or seller or real estate agent or anybody ever shows you numbers on a building uh, that always end in zeros or like three zeros, don't believe it for an instant. I know this is unbelievable, kids, but sometimes the seller has a tendency to round those numbers off. In what direction? Up. Well, the income, what direction? Up. Up and the expenses, down. Don't believe it. And there are brokers around who are notorious for putting out bad operating statements. They use what year's income? Even better than the best, what year? Next year, haven't you ever seen an operating statement from a broker that said, well, the rents are this, but they could be this. Well, get out of town. If they could be this, why aren't they this? Next year's income was what year's expenses? Last year, and it's not gonna work like that. And if you're Carol, you wanna check these numbers out, or if you're listing the property, you, how would you check these numbers? What if I said, Carol, these are the numbers on my property, trust me. Are you gonna trust me? No. Well, I hope not. How would you check those numbers? You could see the books, but are there some sellers who don't keep very good books. I don't mean they're crooks, I just mean they don't keep very good books. Are there some sellers that keep really good books? Are there some sellers that keep such good books? They keep several different sets. You know, books, I got books. <laughs> you don't want the seller's books. If the seller's a rounder, where's the seller gonna round those numbers in just the opposite direction? To whom would the seller round the income down and the expenses up? To the IRS. To the IRS, much of this is sold, property is sold contingent on seeing the seller's what? Tax return, what schedule? Schedule E, schedule E, write that down. Schedule E is nothing fancy, uh, but any of us, schedule E is the form that we use to file uh, uh, the report of our rental property. Uh, it's, it's where we report income and expenses to the IRS. If the seller's a rounder, what's he telling the IRS about income? Income, I can't rent this cruddy building to anybody. And what about the expenses? Everything they can think of goes on that schedule. E. How important is it to have accurate income and expenses here? Really, really important. It couldn't be important. -er. This, worksheet is, this worksheet is great, but it's an absolute perfect example of garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage in this, in this worksheet, it'll grind away and it'll produce a big pile of garbage. 
So you want to be as accurate as possible with this. Now, no buyer is going to call up the seller and say, send me your Schedule E. Uh, that's not how it works. But if, you're a, if you have a, a, a property listed for sale, if you're the, the realtor and you have the property listed for sale, you should have the Schedule E in your file when? Before you list the property. Yep. If you have a rental property listed and you do not have the Schedule E in your file, right up front, you're not doing your job. Your entire reputation is at stake here. How many of you ever looked at a property and the numbers on the property turned out to be far different than those represented by the listing broker? See, that's, that's shameful. That's not good. That's not good. Now, typically how this is done is the listing agent, as you're, when you're listing the property, you get the Schedule E, you put those numbers out to the marketplace, and then the buyer, Carol, makes an offer based on those numbers contingent upon seeing the seller's Schedule E. That's tipping within X days, and she has X days to avoid the transaction in her absolute discretion. Question? How many years Schedule E? Yeah, you know, I, I, the question is how many years Schedule E? I, I, I think you're fine just getting one, unless you, there are some people, I know it's unbelievable, who will run a building a certain way the year before they sell to make it look better. If you suspect that, you might want to go back two or three years. Yeah. Yeah, you want, you want to do anything you can do to make these numbers accurate. That's, that's, that's the real key. And, you, uh, you know, I'll tell you, how many of you like this stuff we're talking about here? If you like this stuff, when we're done, uh, come up or look on the last page of your, of your handout, or you, I've got it, the same thing here on a green sheet. You're seeing a little taste of a long online video seminar. If you like this stuff, Fill that out, it's only 99 bucks. I do free coaching, anybody who buys that. So you, you give that to me. If you like this stuff, you'll love that. If you don't like this stuff, you'd hate that because it goes way beyond. Well, so anyway, I get phone calls. I got a phone call not too long ago from a lady in Springfield, Illinois. Springfield's the capital of Illinois. This lady called me up and she said, hey Tom, I want to tell you a story. I said, oh yeah, what? She said, I was, uh, I, she was attempting to buy, I think it was a little 10 unit apartment building in Springfield. And she said the listing agent was offering the prop, was saying with gross operating income of $93,800, $93,800 something, $93,800. And she said, I did it just like you said on your video. She said, I, I made an offer contingent on seeing the seller's uh, Schedule E within three days, and she has three days to avoid the transaction in her absolute discretion. All right, well, that's fine. I said, so what's, what's the problem? She said, I presented the offer one morning to the listing broker, and the listing broker went ballistic. The listing broker said, what is this Schedule E thing? We don't do that Schedule E here. What are you doing that for? She said, well, I need to know the numbers are right. He said, I don't care, we don't do that. And I said, so what'd you do? She said, well, I folded up my briefcase and went home. You know, I can't. Well, she said, that afternoon, the listing broker called her back and said, you know, I've been doing some checking, and I guess it's reasonable that you would want to verify the numbers. So they revived the offer, negotiated, got an accepted offer, contingent on seeing the seller's Schedule E. Now, she bought that property based on uh, the representation that the gross operating income was how much? $93,800, $93,800, something. Yep, she got the Schedule E, how much? Take a guess, $38,000. $38,000. Now you tell me, would that skew the numbers a little bit? If you're buying a money machine expecting it to produce $93,000 and it produces $38,000. And that's not going to work, so she of course walked away from that. Do you agree the worksheet will tell you what not to buy? It'll help you know what not to buy, which is just as important as knowing what to buy. So don't believe it ends in zeros. The other thing is there's a little measurement that we use called an operating expense ratio. Let's put it off to the side there. If, if you have this property listed and uh, somebody called you up and said, gee, what's the operating expense ratio on that thing? All they're talking about is the operating expenses uh, divided by the gross operating income. And if you do that math, you'll get the operating expense ratio. See what numbers I'm using? I'm just taking the 26,650, dividing by the 56,715, you get an operating expense ratio about 47%. That's a 47% operating expense ratio. What does that mean? What does it mean in words? Of every dollar that Carol takes in, 47 cents is already spent just to do what? Just to run the business. That means she's got 53 cents left out of every dollar to do what with? Pay, pay her debt, yep, pay her debt, because that's not part of the operating expenses. Pay her debt and pay herself. She's got to get her debt and herself paid, not out of a dollar, 
but out of 53 cents. Therefore, is this operating expense ratio a real important number to know? Yeah. And will there be an average operating expense ratio in your town on certain types of property? And that'll be a number you'll know with some experience. And that'll be different on a shopping center that is on a rental house that is on a apartment building. The average operating expense ratio in this country, now that's a big place, on a little apartment building like this would be somewhere around 45 to 50 percent. So we're not, we're not far off here. If we don't know the numbers on a property, we routinely just cut the income in half and you won't be that far off. Now what if you were looking at a property and the numbers, the, the operating expense ratio seemed really, really low, you know, just real low. What could cause your, your, op your operating expenses to be less than average legitimately? What could cause that? Utilities. Could be a newer building. It could be the owner's not fixing anything. What if I said, Carol, repairs? Are you kidding? This is such a great building that I am selling to you. I have not had to repair one thing for eight straight years. <laughs> what does that mean? The day after she buys it, what happens? The whole thing falls apart. But no, 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 more obvious than that. What are your two biggest expenses? Property tax and utilities are generally the two biggest expenses. The, uh, if you see one that, that seems really low, check to see if it's, uh, the tenant pays their own utilities, because that'll make a big difference. The tenant, yeah, and I think that I, if, if you, the owner, are paying the utilities, are you at risk, not only in the real estate market, but also in the utilities market? Yeah, yeah, how cold does it get here? Cold, cold, right here, right over there. It's gonna be cold in a couple of months, freezing. It's gonna be freezing, it's great, it's great. Uh, you get in your car, you drive down the street, it's freezing outside. You drive by your apartment building, look at the upstairs window, what is it? Wide open, why? The tenant's hot, man. And what's the furnace doing? Chug, 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 on whose meter? The owner's meter. How many of you truly have seen a building with the windows open and the furnace running? How many of you have been in a building where there's a cage over the thermostat? I don't mean a plastic thing like that, I mean a cage, a metal mesh cage with a padlock on it. This is a major problem for building owners. I used to teach a class at the University of Minnesota on investment and tax. And I was speaking there one time and we were in this great big auditorium and the place was packed and had a balcony and the balcony was packed. And I was down on the floor of the stage and I said, how many of you ever been in a building where there's a cage over the thermostat? And there was a kid in the front row of the balcony right up there. And he raised his hand and I called on him and he stood up and he said, I know how to get around that. Well, not like I was asking for ideas from the audience. <laughs> he told the class he lives in an 11-unit apartment building by the University of Minnesota, and the owner has one furnace in there, and the owner keeps it too cold in there, and the owner has a cage over the thermostat, a metal mesh cage with a padlock on it. He said, we can't even, can't even get a pencil to move the thing. This kid said every night when it's cold outside, what the tenants do is they get a great big bucket of ice water and a great big beach towel, and they dip the beach towel into the ice water, and they hang the towel over the thermostat cage. And he said, that furnace runs all night. Uh, and this kid, no lie, this kid was proud as can be of this. So how about this? Would there be an average operating expenses with the owner paying the utilities versus the tenant paying the utilities? In this case, 47%. Uh, is, is reasonable. So we know the income, we know the expenses, we know the financing, we know the three parts. Now we want to estimate the four benefits. And look at Roman numeral one, two, three, four, cash flow, principal reduction, tax savings, and appreciation. And more importantly, how to calculate them. If you just follow the worksheet, it'll lead you right through like a roadmap. So let's help Carol, let's help her out. Remember, when is she doing this? Before she buys the property. She hasn't bought the property. So we start with the uh, gross operating income, how much? Now, pay attention to where these numbers come from. That, that's the 56,715, so put that right there. I'm just bringing that number down. Then notice the worksheet tells you what to do. It says minus the operating expenses, which are how much? 26,650, so put that there. Then it says that equals what? If you do the math, that's 30,065. 30,065, and we call that 30,065 her net operating income. NOI, have you heard that term before, the NOI? Put a little star in the margin by the net operating income. The net operating income is the center of the universe and everything else is just kind of planets revolving around it. The net operating income is the amount of money Carol would have in her pocket at the end of the year if she bought the property, how? Cash, if Carol came along and said $390,000, no problem, and she wrote a check for $390,000. Uh, she'd have 30,065 in her pocket, but she's not doing that. Carol's come along saying $390,000, okay. But I'll give you 84,000 cash and finance this other 306 like this. So the next thing she has to pay out of that net operating income is her, her mortgage payments, her debt service. What does debt service mean? Just fancy words for 
principal and interest. Look in parentheses. It says monthly P&I times 12. Well, her debt service, how much in this case? 24,432. All right, so we put that there and subtract it. She's left with $5,633. 5633, and we call that 5633 her cash flow before tax. And the market shortcuts a little bit and calls it her cash flow. She's got 5633 in cash flow. Is that good? 5633, good? Better than 5533. Uh, it's not as good as 5733. It's better than negative. How many of you know people own a building where that number is a negative number? How many of you know people own a building and they want that number to be a negative number? No, you do not. You do not. Put your hands down. Nobody in this room knows anybody who wants that number to be negative. If that number was negative, what would it mean to Carol? She'd be losing money. Whose money? Her money. What kind of money? Real money. <laughs> nobody wants to lose their own real money. If you want to lose your own real money, there's a lot easier ways than this. What people want is to make money, but tell the IRS they're losing money. Now, is that a whole different thing? And is that possible? Is it possible to make money, yet tell the IRS they're losing money? Yes. Is that legal? Yes, that's legal. Yes. What a country. Uh, in this case, 5633. Now, you show this to Carol. You say, Carol, come on, you got to buy this thing. What's she going to say? Real world, what's she going to say? Uh, you want me to invest $84,000 of my hard-earned money, worry about this thing all year, I end up with $5,600? I could put the $84,000 in the bank and do practically that well, and I wouldn't have to worry about a thing. And you would say to her, what? You'd say, Carol, that $5,633 is only the first benefit. She says, I didn't want to hear the rest if you're starting with your good stuff. Uh, we might decide, we might decide the deal is good or bad. We just have to decide it's good or bad based on all four benefits. Uh, is she at any financial risk here? Is Carol at any financial risk? None. Zero. When is she doing this? Before she buys the property. She hasn't bought the property. She's just sitting at the kitchen table noodling this out. She's just seeing if it's worth wasting the gas to drive by. The time to do this is before you buy the property. Her biggest risk is she might fall off the kitchen chair. Uh, 5633. Now, can she spend that 5633? Yes. On what? Anything she wants, anything. Instead of a 57, 50, uh, what was it? The, 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 the gross, instead of a $56,715 cruise around the world, could she end up with a $5,633 uh, weekend in uh, Buffalo? <laughs> could have a pretty good weekend in Buffalo for 5600 Now, here, wait, wait, wait. Would you believe me if I said these words? Those dollars of cash flow, those dollars of cash flow are twice as good as a dollar from your job. It's true. You should believe it because it's true and you should be telling your clients this. All dollars are not created equal. They all look the same, but they're not the same. They're all treated differently by whom or by what? IRS. If the IRS treats different dollars differently, then we should treat different dollars differently. And depending on what kind of dollar is, it has its own set of tax rules. What if I said, I'm not messing around, I'm not buying this stupid investment property. At 5633, I'll just work some overtime on my job and make 5633. What's the difference between that? The 5633 at my job, what would I have to pay on that? Federal tax, state tax, self-employment tax, social security tax. That's half. That adds up to 50%. Half of it's gone. If I earn that 5633 from my cash flow, that's a whole different set of tax rules. And that 5633 we're going to see can be sheltered from income tax, state and federal, and it's exempt from Social Security or self-employment tax. People who make their living on their, uh, on their cash flow don't pay Social Security tax. There's no self-employment tax on that. The, this is so important to just, just tell your clients this. Those dollars from your rental property are twice as good as dollars from your job. I would have to earn at my job twice the 50, I'd have to earn $11,000 on my job to equal 56.33 cash flow. And uh, that's so, so important to tell people uh, this. Does that make sense? All right, so we got 56.33. That's the first benefit, we gotta keep going though. Second benefit, principal reduction. What do we mean by principal reduction? Yeah, well, that debt service, let's repeat the debt service. That debt service, uh, that 24432 that debt service made, made up of two things. What? 
principal and interest, if you take the time to amortize that loan, and amortize, remember, is a three-syllable word. It's the second most mispronounced word in our business. What's the first? The first leads by a mile. Realtor. The word is not realtor. It's realtor. Now, we all know that in here, but how many of you know someone who actually claims to be one? Who pronounces it realtor or the double whammy? They say I'm a realtor with X Y Z reality. That's by far the most. Next time you're somebody in our business, say they're a realtor. You look them right in the eye and tell them they ought to have their head examined <laughs> by a doctor. Uh, now that's by far the most mispronounced. The second most mispronounced is amortize. It's not a motorized or amortize. It's amortize. Muerte, muerte. Anybody speak Spanish in here? Muerte. What's it mean? Death, Death to kill. Amort. When I played baseball in Venezuela, the fans used to tell, I'm Mark the umpire. When I played, you still Mark the umpire and the catcher. I was the catcher. Should I tell you about the time the umpire threw up on my neck? Oh. No, all right, maybe later. All right, now if you take the time, if you take the time to amortize that loan, you'll find 21,321 of that is interest the first year. What that means is the difference, 3111 is principal. 3111 is principal. That means after one year, that Carol wouldn't owe 306,000 anymore. She owes 306 minus the 3111. She owes 303 or whatever it is. And you think, come on, so what's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal. Who paid that for her? The tenants. The tenants paid her loan down 3111. She just doesn't get the money till when? She sells or maybe refinances, right? It's not a current benefit, but absolutely it's a benefit. If you don't think it's a benefit, take it to the extreme. What if that was a $306,000 30-year loan? And she kept that property for 30 years. What would Carol have at the end of 30 years besides an old building and really old tenants? <laughs> an old paid for building that who paid for for? Those old tenants. Those old tenants are saying, Carol, we'd like to buy you this building. Are we going to say no? And yet most of us do say what? 96 out of 100 of us say what? Oh, no, 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 no. They might call me up. Who we'll call you up? They ought to be able to call you up once in a while. They're buying you a building, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> now you show this to Carol and say, Carol, come on, you got to buy this thing. What's she going to say? Real world, what's she going to say? Yeah. 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 Well, we'd say, you'd say that's only two out of the four benefits. We got to keep going. Third benefit it's 1130 p.m. on the night of April 15th. And Carol is thinking, yeah, I better do my taxes. Uh, now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's her taxable income on this property? How much money does she have in her pocket from this property? 5633, what's her taxable income? 5630. Now wait, 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 wait. What about that 3111, that print reduction? Is that taxable? No. Taxable when? When she sells. Now look me right in the eye, every one of you, right here. Now, even all you all the way over there, right here. Back your mental tape up 11 feet and stop it and we got to tape over the last part because that's wrong and you professional realtor need to know that's wrong this principal reduction is not taxable when you sell it has nothing to do with the tax you pay when you sell when you sell your property you pay tax on your what gain gain your mortgage has nothing to do with your gain your mortgage has to do with your equity there's no tax on equity the tax is on gain and gain and equity are how many different things yeah, they didn't get that back there. Two, two, how are they related? They're not, they're totally unrelated. Could you have a large equity in a property and no gain? Conversely, could you have no equity in a property and a large gain? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the principal reduction is not taxable when you sell. It's taxable every year. The cash flow and the principal reduction are both taxable every year. Does it make sense the 5633 cash flow is taxable? Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because what is that cash flow to Carol? Income from her customers. Take that logic one step further. Where did she get the 3111 she used to pay down her loan? From her customers. The IRS said, hey, if it comes from your customers, it's taxable. Well, both of those numbers come from her customers, therefore they are both taxable. That's the bad news. But there's always good news. Yes, they're taxable, but they can both be sheltered by the depreciation. You see, Congress, who writes the rules, wants, wants Carol or any of us to buy this property. She's, or she's going to provide housing for these wonderful people. She's going to fix up the neighborhood. She's going to invest her money. The seller's going to pay tax on the money. Whatever's left over, the seller's going to go out and buy stuff. 
and all those people pay tax on the money. So she creates a lot of tax by buying the property. They want her to buy the property. As incentive for her to buy the property, Congress says, Carol, if you buy this property, we'll let you write it off as if it's going to zero value over time. We recognize it might be going up in value, but we'll let you write it off as if it's going to zero value over time. And that process is called what? Depreciation. depreciation. Technically, absolute technically, it's not called depreciation anymore. It's called what? Two words, you've heard them. Cost re cover <laughs> cost recovery. Have you heard of that term? Cost recovery, cost recovery, depreciation, same thing, same thing. If a customer in the marketplace says to you, "Gee, what would my cost recovery be?" You go, "Man, I don't know. We didn't talk about that." No, no, no. Cost recovery, depreciation, same thing. You know what? The honest truth is the IRS doesn't care a darn about anything we've done up here so far. All the IRS cares about is Roman numeral three. Roman numeral three is how you figure the taxable income on any business in America. A little rental house, a big shopping center, a restaurant, your own real estate practice. It's nothing more than the net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation. The, you know what that really is? That's Schedule E with all the fat boiled out of it. Schedule E is really 36 lines long. Here it is just <laughs> trash compacted down to four lines. Net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation. All right, well, that doesn't look so bad. Let's help her out. Here's our friend Carol. We start with the net operating income. How much? Now, net operating income, how much? 30. That's the 30065 So know where these, come, these numbers come from. Now, that, I'm just bringing it down from Roman numeral one. Now, the next thing she had to pay out of the net operating income in Roman numeral number one is her debt service. But is her entire debt service deductible for tax purposes? No, only the... Interest, how much interest did she pay? Just bring the interest down from Roman numeral two, right? So bring that down, that 21,321. 21,321, notice you can only deduct the interest. You cannot deduct the principal. You have to leave the principal in there, and that has the effect of making it taxable. So net operating income minus the interest minus this third thing, this depreciation. And this is the part that goofs people up, and it shouldn't. We can make it real. Simple. She needs to, to the, as incentive for her to buy the property, the IRS says, uh, uh, Carol, you'll, you need, you'll, you'll be able to write this thing off as if it's going to zero value over time. And that's called depreciation or cost recovery. Now, in order to figure her depreciation, she has to know what is she actually buying? What is she actually buying? Don't write anything down. I got it all written down for you. Just put your pencil down. Just put, put, lean back in your chair. Just fold your arms. That's a nice touch. Fold your arms. Don't smile. Don't smile. You don't want to look like you're having any fun and continuing it. Just tilt your head sideways with your eyes about half open, look real grumpy, and just kind of tap your foot like, what's he talking about now? Perfect. Now, a lot of you didn't even have to move. Okay, now here, now here, 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 here. Here. What is she, she needs to know what is she actually buying? For, for 390,000, what's she buying? She's buying land, yeah, what else? Building, what tangible? Tangible physical assets. Land, building, keep talking to me. Personal property, land improvements. Four things. You're buying four things when you buy a rental property. And you want to divide your cost into those four categories. Turn back to your page two and look at the bottom. I've got where you wrote the four benefits. Underneath there, it's, uh, it says depreciation rules. And I've got land, building, personal property, and land improvements. Right, you with me? So she needs, now, most people just divide it into land and building. Most of you in this room own rental property, and all you've done is divide it into land and building. That's really bad. It's legal, but you're throwing away money. Some of you do land, building, and personal property. That's better, but it's not good. You want to do all four of these. Now, she needs to know how much of that is land. How would you do that? You could call the assessor. If you were my client, you wouldn't go near the assessor. True or false? Your assessor has no clue the value of that property. How many of you have ever seen a property sell for a price different than its assessed value? You know what, now you gotta tell me. In New York, when you're, when you're doing a listing presentation, you do not waste your time doing one of those CMA deals, do you? Where you compare this property to others like it that have sold recently with a garage and a fireplace. What a waste of time that is. Don't you just call the assessor? <laughs> 
You think, well, that's stupid. Well, I agree it's stupid. If it's stupid there, it's just as stupid here. No, how do we do it? How do those, those of us who buy rental property? There's a word coming to you. Be, be open to it and let it come to you. And I can read your mind. I know exactly what you are all thinking. Bifurcate. That's what you're all thinking. Bifurcate. Now, you're probably sitting there wondering, how in the heck did he know that? What does bifurcate mean? It's not a bad word. You can say it in a mixed company, bifurcate, bifurcate. What does it mean? It just means divide. Look it up. It just means divide. We're actually, we're dividing into four. We are by, by, by bifurcating. If Carol was buying this property and she got good tax advice, her good advisor would say, Carol, you need to bifurcate. Now, a buyer can bifurcate anywhere, but where is the best place to bifurcate? Um, on the purchase contract. Her good advisor would say, Carol, you need to bifurcate right on that purchase contract. <laughs> yeah, and what that means is, when she, when, she makes, when she makes this offer to me, $390,000, right in the agreement, she adds a little paragraph that says something like, it is agreed the purchase cost is allocated as follows. Land this much, building this much, personal property this much, land improvement, adding up to the 390. Does the seller care how much is land building, personal property, and land improvements? No. Yes, the seller cares even more than the buyer. I'm talking about an investor seller, and not the house you live in, an investor seller. The investor seller cares, and the buyer cares, and they care oppositely. Any of you who have ever sold a rental property without bifurcating the agreement, you paid way more tax than you have to pay. And if you did, if you did that, you need to have a most serious discussion with whoever does your tax uh, planning, all right? now. So she needs to know, she needs to know. Why, does, why, does the buyer, why does the buyer care? The buyer and seller both care and they care oppositely. Why does the buyer care? Each of these is depreciated over a different number of years. Why does the seller care? They're each taxed, they're each taxed differently, yeah. When you sell your rental property, you pay tax on your what? You pay tax on your gain. Not gain, gains. You have a gain on the land, you have a gain on the building, you have a gain on the personal, and you have a gain on the land improvements, and they're all taxed differently. So I, the seller, want to get as much of my gains on the thing that's taxed the least. The buyer, Carol, wants to get as much of her cost on the thing that's depreciated the fastest. And the way that works out to be is we want opposite things. What's good for the buyer, bad for the seller, and vice versa. Any of you who have ever done this without putting it in the agreement, you, 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 you swung and missed. And the penalty, you didn't do anything illegal, you just paid more tax than you had to pay. All right, so we're looking at this from the buyer's eyes. In the, in the greet sheet here, fill this out if you like this, or the back page, we go into it from the seller's eyes and go much deeper than this. But we're looking at it from buyer. Why does the buyer care? Each of these is depreciated over a different number of years. I want you to know the number of years. So stay on page two, go back to page two, and let's put the number of years next to each one of these. The land, you depreciate the land over how many years? Land. Zero, put a big zero there. You can't depreciate the land. So we move on to personal property. Personal property would be things like stove, refrigerator, washer, dryer, drapes, curtains, carpeting, mailbox, garbage can. How many years? Five years, five years. What if it's a really old refrigerator? How many years? Five years. What if it's a brand new refrigerator right out of the box? Five years. What if I've owned this property for years and years and years? I've depreciated all this junk down to nothing. Can Carol buy it from me and start all over again? Yes, and you think, come on, how many times can the fridge wear out? Don't even think of it as wearing out, think of it as what? Appreciate. What's the other word? Cost recovery. Every buyer gets to recover her cost. Much of this property has been depreciated over and over and over again because every buyer gets to recover her cost. All right, the building, how many years? The building, there's two possibilities. Not two choices, two possibilities. It depends on whether it's a residential or a non-residential rental property. I separate these for you, didn't I? The IRS distinguishes between a residential rental building and a non-residential rental building. What's the definition of a non of a, uh, what's the definition of a residential rental building? Anything that people live in. Yep, live in. For at least how long? At least how long? Ten years. No, now the two year thing, that's your primary residence. No, month to month. Month to month is the minimum tenancy. To be a residential rental building, month to month or greater. You can't have a residential rental building that's less than month-to-month -month tenancy. If you stay in a hotel, you live in there, but it's day-to-day -day tenancy. That's non-residential. That's transient housing. Do any of you own, know somebody or you yourself own a rental a condo that you rent by the week? That's a non-residential rental building. Okay. 
So this little apartment building though for Carroll, this would be a presuming month to month or year lease or something. So that'd be residential rent the building, 27 and a half years. 27 and a half years. What if it's a really old building? How many years? 27 and a half, brand new. 27 and a half. Brick. I got it, all right, 27 and a half. Now don't ask me where they got the 27 and a half. Nobody knows. Having the half on the end sure makes it sound scientific, like it came from somewhere. These are the rules. Now that's for a residential rental building. What's the what, what about a non-residential rental building? What's the definition of a non-residential rental building? Anything that's not a residential rental building. Shopping center, office building, restaurant, weekly rental condo, home office. That's all non-residential rental real estate. How many years? 39 years. 39 years. Now I said I don't know where they got the 27 and a half. I don't. I do, however, know where they got the uh, 39. They added 11 and a half. <laughs> That's how scientific the whole goofy thing is. Don't, don't try to equate this to anything. It has nothing to do with how old the building is or how old you are or how long your mortgage is. That's the rules. Question. I, I don't know if I understand this right or not, but a non-residential building, if you were using it as an Airbnb, Airbnb, if you're not renting it month to month or greater, it's a non-residential building. buy an investment as an Airbnb and write it off for 39 years? Yeah. Yeah, the, an Airbnb, uh, presuming you're doing it month, uh, weekly, that's the building is non-residential. So well, Airbnb is just a way to rent the property. It's not a, def it's not a definition of a property. Yeah, but then you can, yeah. so it's typically short-term rentals. Pardon? You'd almost rather do that. So well, no, no, you'd rather have the 27 and a half years. You're going to get the same amount of money, but would you rather I give you a dollar today or a dollar 39 years from today? See, that, that's so you'd rather have the residential typically. What about mixed use building? Mixed use building. What if I had a, 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 a bakery on Main Street and upstairs there's four apartments? What kind of building is that? Well, what do I want it to if it, Now, there's no such thing as mixed depreciation. Well, uh, what do you want it to be? Residential. To be residential, 80% of the gross income or more has to come from the apartments. 80% or more. 80% or more. All right. Now, so this property for Carroll would be residential 27 and a half years. Now, put a little star by land improvements. Those of you who work with investors who, or who are one, I want you to go to your investor client. I want you to say, how are you depreciating your land improvements? And I'll bet you a dollar their answer is what? Huh? They won't even know what you're talking about. Those of you who own property yourself, go to your own accountant and say, how am I depreciating my land improvements? If your own accountant says, huh, it's time to make what we call an exchange. <laughs> and I don't mean of properties, I mean of accountants. This is the second biggest phone call I get from people hear me on, uh, on the green sheet here, or your last page. If you get that, the, I, the, the coaching I do, I get phone calls. The second biggest phone call I get deals with uh, land improvements. And I can tell, I can hear, I can see it a mile away. They'll call up and they'll say, hey, Tom, I've been investing for 25 years. I say, great. They say, but I never heard of land improvements. I heard you're on your video. I said, I can't help it. I didn't invent it. Here's what land improvements are. Land improvements are improvements to the land that don't service the building. Improvements to the land that don't service the building. And don't even write that down. That's a stupid definition. <laughs> it is. That's IRS definition. Can I, can I tell you how to tell if something's a land improvement using people talk, not IRS talk? Yeah, yeah. Here's how to tell if something's a land improvement using people talk. Here's how we do it on the, on the video series. A land improvement is an improvement to the land <laughs> that if it could talk would be able to say these words. I don't need no stinking building to do what I do. That's a land improvement. Now think about this. Now, wait, 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 wait. Think about this. Think of the rental property you own. Aren't there improvements to that property that if they could talk would be able to say, I don't need no stinking building to do what I do. Like what? <laughs> All the landscaping, fence. What else? Road, Dr road uh, parking lot, driveway, uh, uh, underground sprinkling system, swimming pool, tennis court, playground, golf course. Those are all land improvements. Uh, don't forget your land. If you own a rental house, how many of you have a rental, rental house that has a lawn? That lawn don't need no stinking building to be a lawn. Uh, that's landscaping. Uh, and so don't forget this. This, this. I get this phone call. I can't tell you how many times I get this phone call from people who hear this stuff. All right. So 
Now, I was speaking, you know, I was speaking one time, and, uh, or utilities. People say, how about utilities? Are utilities land improvements? Typically, no. Why? They need the building. Without the building, utilities have nothing to uh, util. Uh, now, the, no, wait, wait. The exception, the exception would be utilities that service land improvements are land improvements. Utilities that light your parking lot, run the swimming pool, filter, you know, that kind of stuff. I was speaking in Wilmington, North Carolina one time. A little bitty lady came up to me at a break and she said, hey, Tom, how'd I appreciate a whale? I said, a whale? She said, yeah, I got a whale in my backyard. And I'm thinking, you know. <laughs> well, you know what she was saying, don't you? A well. A well. How'd I appreciate a whale? I thought she had a big fish in her backyard. Here, now wait. Now, would a well be a land improvement? Would a, would a well be a land improvement? Well, could it be a land improvement? If it pumps water to the building, no. But what if it pumps water to irrigate or feed the cattle or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got, now, you've got land improvements. In your rental house, you've got a lot of land improvements. Where do most people who have land improvements depreciate their land improvement? They put in with a building, they do it over 27 and a half or 39 years. Or even worse, they put in with the land and they don't depreciate at all. Stop doing that. Because land improvements are depreciable over 15 years. And we get accelerated depreciation, meaning we get more early and less later on. You, any of you who own rental property, if you are not depreciating your land improvements, you need to have a serious discussion with your accountant. I was speaking in Queens one time, and a guy came up to me at the break. He came walking down the aisle. I could tell he's walking with a pur purpose. And he said, hey, Tom, I just want you to know I'm a big time CPA with a big time accounting firm here in New York City. And I said, well, condolences. And uh, he said, what you say is exactly right, but we only do that for our large commercial clients. And I said, that's pathetic. And it is pathetic. Uh, there's no, the rules aren't different for a large commercial client than they are for the person who owns a little uh, rental house. Now, let's go back and finish it up. Uh, if you look at the, the worksheet, see the top part, that little square? That's where, you would, that's where you would actually calculate the depreciation, land building, personal property, and land rooms. And I'll show you how to act it. We don't have time today. Those of you who are serious about this, fill out the last page and give it to me, or fill it out here. If you fill it out and give it to me, uh, you're going to get copies of the, of the worksheet and the rights to use it and everything. But so, uh, uh, I'll show you how to do that there. For the, in here, just because of our time, let's assume the depreciation, the depreciation on this property is 18,572. 18,572, so put, just for right now, trust me. That's the first year depreciation, 18,572. Now, here's my question, so what, big whoop, where does it go? What good does that 18,572 do for Carol? We, we're down in Roman numeral three now. So net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation, we now know the depreciation is 18,572. So put that number right there. And now if you make this calculation, net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation, you get a taxable income how much? Negative. Negative or taxable income is a negative 9828. Those brackets mean negative. Everybody see that? Negative 9828. You show, what if you show this to Carol? You say, Carol, 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 look at this, your taxable income's negative 9828. What's she gonna say if she's like most people out in the marketplace when you say, hey, your taxable income's negative 9828. Most people say what to that? Most people say, that's it, pal. If you mean I lose another 9,800 bucks on this turkey, I'm out of here. And you would say to her, what? How much money is she losing? <laughs> Nothing. As a matter of fact, what does she have in her pocket? 56.33 in her pocket. The tenants paid her low down 31.11. She's ahead 8,700 here. Really? Well, when the IRS says, hey, Carol, how'd you do on this property? What does she say? Oh, oh man, are you kidding? I lost 9,828 bucks. Well, the IRS says, Carol, if you lost 9828, you can now take that loss outside the building and use it over here against your income from your job or other sources. Now, this is subject to something called the passive loss rules. The passive loss rules govern when, not if, when you can use this loss. Most people can use that loss right now this year. Some people, depending on their income, carry it forward. We go into the passive loss rules on the green sheet, you know, so that's beyond this. But let's assume, they, they, don't let somebody tell you the passive loss rules say you cannot use the loss. No, they change when you can use the loss. We're assuming that Carol can use the loss this year. That negative 20, 9828 will shelter 9828 of her income from her job. Can you take a loss every 
Yeah, you can take a loss every year this way. This is not hobby rule. You, have to, to, you know, the hobby rules, if you're running some bogus business just losing money, that's a hobby rule. But no, you're making money here. Your intent is to make money, and you are, in fact, making money. There are many, many, many people in this country who have never had any taxable income. Now, there's two ways to do it. Two ways. One is don't earn any money. That's the least preferable. The second is to shelter all the money you earn. All right. So now the 9828 will she that'll she does she, that's 9828 of other income she does not have to pay tax on. Is she going to save or pay tax? Save. Save. Whenever you're telling the IRS you're losing money, circle taxes saved. Is she going to save state income tax as well as federal income tax? Yeah. Could you even have some of you have county or city income tax? How many of you have county or city income tax? Yeah. So uh, anyway, she's going to save. Could she easily be in a 35% tax bracket, state and federal? State and federal. Let's say 30, 35. Most of you are in a 30, 35. Let's say 35%. 35% of that is $3,440 income tax saved. 3440 income tax saved. Is that cash money? It's cash, isn't it? That's cash. Because if she does not buy this property, if she doesn't buy this property, what happens to that 3440? She pays it to the IRS. They want it in what? Cash. 3440. That's the third benefit here. The fourth benefit is appreciation. Appreciation. What do you think we ought to use for appreciation? I think we ought to use a percentage. What do you think we ought to use? Three? Two? Four? You know what? I think we ought to use nothing. And it's my seminar, so guess what? We're going to use nothing. Put zero there. The money machine ought to make sense with no appreciation. I'm not saying I want no appreciation. I'm saying the machine ought to make sense as if there was no appreciation. The appreciation ought to be frosting on the cake. And I hope the frosting is thick, thick, thick. But the cake ought to taste good by itself. If you're buying property where none of those first three numbers mean anything, they don't make any sense, but you're buying it because you think it's going to go up in value. How many of you know somebody who bought a rental property, a money machine that loses money, negative cash flow, but they bought it anyway because it's going to go what? Up in value. That's stupid. <laughs> that is not investing in real estate. Do not deceive yourself into believing you're a real estate investor. That is real estate speculating. No, there's nothing wrong with it, but recognize the difference. A speculator doesn't do any of this. An investor is buying a money machine. A spec if a speculator, if the property doesn't go up in value, they, they don't make any money, they lose money. So a spec the only way, if you're, a spe if you're buying a rental property where none of these numbers make any sense, but you're buying it because you think it's going to go up in value, you are counting on in the future being able to find somebody even dumber than you. <laughs> You've got to find somebody who's even dumber than you who has money. <laughs> That's hard to do. That's hard to do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on being able to find anybody dumber than me. All right, so let's say zero. Down at the bottom, it says the various rates of return. Look at the second one. Here's our rate of return before any appreciation. You add, it's going to add up. We're going to add up the right-hand column. We add up the cash flow, 56.33, the 31.11 principal, the 34.40 in tax savings. If you add that all up, what's that total? Total is 12,184. What would she, Carol, be investing to get 12,184? 84,000. If you do that, that's 14.5% uh, in your money. 14% in your money. It's 14.5% in your money. Is that good or bad? Well, I don't know good or bad. Good or bad compared to what? You're thinking, hey, 15%, 14.5%, 15% sounds pretty good compared to money in the bank. Well, yeah, but you can't compare real estate to money in the bank. You've got to compare real estate to what? Other real estate. So right now, you don't know whether that's good or bad in your town. That's not a pejorative statement. You just don't know because you haven't done the work. You need to use the worksheet to see what's happening in your town, and you'll know what's good and what's bad in your particular uh, town. Would you believe me if I said there's lots of people in the real estate business who cannot do what you just did right here? Would you believe me if I said there are lots of people in here who can't do what you just did right here? No, you can do it. You can do it. Is there any hard math here? Is there one bit of hard math? It's just plus minus. You learn how to do this in fourth grade. No. How many of you can see a use for this stuff right here? You got to get really good at this. You got to learn it. You just got to learn it and over and over and over learn it. Now, what if you showed this to me 
I was your client. I said, you know, this is pretty cool. This is, I've never, I've never heard this before. Uh, 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 you know, I've known lots of realtors and all they ever do is send me refrigerator magnets and recipes. Uh, and I, and I never heard of this. Uh, but you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy. And if I had a $306,000 loan on my property, I would lie awake at night staring at the ceiling, wondering how in the world am I ever going to pay it if something goes wrong? So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'll buy this property, but I'm going to pay cash. Are there people who pay cash for their rental property? Yeah. yeah. And I said, uh, uh, if I said, could, now could you figure out my return if I pay cash? You'd say, well, sure I could. Now, is my return going to be higher or lower? I don't have any of that old mortgage payment anymore. Higher or lower? Higher? Lower? All right, we got it narrowed down. Uh, it's going to be one of those. All right, remember, it's a three-part money machine. It's income, expense, and financing, and we're only going to change what? We're not changing the income. We're not changing the expenses. We're changing the financing. All right, let's do it for cash. You don't have to write anything. You just sit there again. Uh, none of the top part changes, right? The income and the expenses. So look at this. I'd have, wouldn't I still have 56, 7, 15? I'd have 30,065 net operating income. That doesn't change. Minus the debt service, which is what? Zero. Zero. So that equals 30,065 in cash flow, which is way better than that cruddy 5633 you showed me the other way. And you'd say, hang on, big boy. All right, so that's the first benefit, 30,065. The second benefit, principal reduction. How much? Nothing, there's no principal reduce. Now what do we tell the IRS? Same formula, net operating income, 30,065, minus the interest, which is how much? Zero, no interest, minus the depreciation, 18,572. Wait, you mean to tell me the depreciation is the same whether you get a mortgage or pay cash? Uh, yes. The depreciation doesn't care about your financing. If you make that calculation though, you end up with a taxable income 11,493. Now that's a what 11,493? That's a positive 11,493. Whereas before, remember Carol was getting a negative 9868. Now we're getting a positive 11,493. What does that mean? The IRS is okay, okay. You are now making money, so we are now what? Taking money. You got to circle taxes paid now, man. In a 35% tax bracket, 35% of that is $4,023 paid. The appreciation, still nothing. Let's add up the benefits. $30,065 plus zero. Your tax saved is a negative number now. The IRS is going to reach into your pocket and take away $4,023. So I'm left with $26,042. What would I be investing in at $26,042? $390. I paid cash. If you do that math, that's six. 0.7% on your money. Same building, same income, same expenses, same tenants. You do it the first way, you earn 15%, 14.5%. You do it this way, you earn 6 Does that mean don't pay cash? No, but it means if you do, do it with your eyes open. Do you agree with me that we in the real estate business ought to present the options? Wouldn't you say, Tom, 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 if you want to pay cash, we'll write it up. You'll earn your 6%. But Tom, 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 if you really do have $390,000 to invest, you ought to at least think about buying what? Four. four of these. Four of these. Do I have enough money to buy four, given our numbers? Yeah. Given our numbers. Is this just a trick? It's just a trick you realtors do. You'd say, realtor. I say, I don't know what you call it. Yeah. It's just a trick. No, no, no. We're not in it to trick people. We help people build and manage their wealth. I have enough money to buy four of these and have 50000 left over, wouldn't I? Or close to it. If I buy, what if I said, I, 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 you're crazy, you're crazy. I want to pay cash because I need that $26,000. I want that $26,000. What would you say? You'd say instead of $26,000, would you consider $37,000? And I say, get out. If I buy four of these, do I have enough money to buy four? I'd have four of the cash flows, 5633 times four is 24,000, right? I'd have, uh, let's not count the principal reduction, that's not cash. I'd have four of the tax savings, that's 16000 You add them together, that's $38,000 versus the 26000 Plus, if there is any appreciation, I'd have the appreciation on what? Four rather than one. What's the right answer? There is no right answer, but our job is to at least present the options. Do you agree with me? Most people in our business don't present any options. Oh, that's harsh. That's, that's, that's harsh. 
Most people in our business present options. Refrigerator magnet or recipe? <laughs> now, don't, if you're sending out recipes and you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. But, but that, that, you know, that, that's, that, it's pretty hard to compete who's got the best recipes. How many of you can think of, how many of you can think of a real human being who would be interested in what we're doing here? Get, learn this stuff, learn this stuff and show them. What if I said, you're killing me? You're killing me! How many properties have we talked about here? One. I mean, same property. Same property. Do it the one way, we get 14%. Do it the other way, we get six. Isn't there another way I could do this? Watch this. How many of you, have, how many of you know somebody who has 84,000 home equity? Could I go down and borrow 84,000 against the equity in my home? Yeah, assume I qualify. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the problem with borrowing money is you got to what? You got to pay it back. Not only do you have to pay it back, you got to pay it back plus what? Interest at what rate today? Second mortgage. I don't want one of those fakey adjustable rate loans. I want a real loan. I don't know what, six? Five, six. Let's say 10. 10. If it's less than 10, it's better than I'm going to show you. 10% of that is $8,400. What is that $8,400? Yeah, yeah, but what is it? It's interest. But what is interest? What if I just landed on this planet? And I said, what is this interest thing you earthlings have? What would you say? It's just rent. It's just rent. If you don't have a house, you rent an apartment. If you don't have a car, you rent a car. If I don't have money, what can I do? Rent money. That's all you're doing. I go down to First National Rent a Center. And I say, hey, I'd, li I'd like to rent 84,000 of your dollars. They say, okay, but the rent is 8,400. You say, okay. They say, here, sign the lease. Now, does the IRS want me to rent that money? They are Congress who makes the rules. They do. How do you know they do? Because they say if you rent money, what? We'll help you make the payments. If you rent an apartment, we're not doing anything for you. Now, this is real important. In 2019, where we are right now, can you deduct the interest on a home equity loan? You've heard what? You've heard you cannot do it, haven't you? You've heard it. Up until 2018, end of two, you could borrow 100000 against your house and use it for anything you want. Remember that? And it all changed in 2019. Home equity debt no longer deductible. That's a true statement. All right. And if your accountant says, hey, you've got to talk, you talk with a good accountant before you do any of this, right? Right? Don't take it. Don't, don't believe any of this stuff. You go check it out. Uh, but what, if your accountant says you can't deduct the interest on a home equity debt, Ask your accountant about what the, uh, the IRS tracing rules, trace, like tra T-R-A-C-I-N-G, tracing rules. The tracing rules say the, the, whether the interest is de deductible or not depends on what you use the money for. If you use this money to go on vacation, nah. But if you use that money to buy a rental property, then it's not home equity debt. It's, it's business debt. It's investment. Yeah, and that's a whole different thing. So be sure to ask about that. So this, if I use this, and you want to be able to, they want to be able to trace it, trace it. You got to show, show you use that eighty-four thousand to buy that rental property. So it's a good idea to maybe set it in a different account, or use a, a, a line of credit so you're paying direct before. You want to show you trace. You want to be able to trace it. If it's deductible and I'm in a thirty-five percent tax bracket, I'm going to save about a third of that in tax. I'm rounding about a third of that in tax. So it actually cost me $5,600, yes or no? $5,600 is the actual cost to rent that money. Now, if I use that money to buy that little apartment building, could that be doable? With it, or Carol, you know, with the 84,000 cash invested? Uh, what, would, what would you get based on our numbers? You get cash flow of 5633, principal reduction of 3111, tax savings 3440, appreciation nothing, we didn't, 12,184. That's beautiful. Uh, now, could this be possible? I rented the money, it cost me $5,600. I used the money to buy a money machine that, that produced 12,184. What did borrowing that money and buying that rental property actually cost me? <coughs> Nothing. Nothing. I'm ahead $6,500. It didn't cost me anything. This is the same property, same tenant, same income, same expenses. Look at this. We've used one property today. The first way we did it, uh, Carol got 14, 
uh, or no, got, yeah, 14 and a half percent. Then we paid cash and we got six. Now we're doing it this way. What's my rate of return if I do it this way? What's my rate of return here? Same property, if I buy it this way, what's my rate of return? It's an infinite rate of return. It's an infinite rate. I'm earning $6,500, I didn't invest anything. You think, come on, you gave up, you gave up 84,000 equity in your home. Yeah, but I gained 84,000 equity in a rental property. I didn't give up any equity, I just moved. I just reallocated my equity. It's an infinite return. Plus, some of you told me I could borrow the money at less than 10%. If I can borrow the money at less than 10%, it's infinity earth. <laughs> Look at the power of this. Will the average guy do this? No, why not? Because they're the average guy. The average guy is home watching people eat worms on TV. <laughs> the average guy looks at this and says, we're not doing this. Don't listen to this guy. Where did this guy come from? We're not doing this. Uh, well, that's fine. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just saying this is your business. We ought, do you agree with me? We ought to be able to explain this to people. You should be able to explain this to people. If I don't do this, I'm not doing this. Well, that's fine. If I don't do it, what happens? Well, there's a consequence, not nothing. What happens? How much of the $6,500 do I get? How much of the $6,584 do I get? <laughs> nothing. How much of the appreciation do I get? Now, if, there, if there's appreciation on the apartment building, how many of you wish you would have done this 15 years ago? Well, the next 15 years aren't going to be any different. How many of you can think, can you think of a, how many of you can think of a property right now that you believe will be worth more 15 years from today than it is now? All right, how many of you plan on being alive in 15 years? All right, all right, all right. If, if, if you plan on being alive anyway, <laughs> Don't come up to me 15 years from now at the convention and say, oh, Tom, I wish I would have done what you talked about back there in 2019. Because what am I going to say to you? Shut up. <laughs> the average guy is not going to do this. The average, if you don't do it, you don't get any of the 6584. You don't get any of the appreciation. And you, and, but what happens for sure? What happens for sure? You've got to pay 3440 in tax, and you've got to pay 2800 in tax. That's 6240 in tax. If you don't do it, you get none of the benefits, but you have to pay 6240 in tax. Most people choose to pay the 6240 in tax. Why? It's guaranteed. <laughs> it's guaranteed because this is too risky. How many are glad you were here the last hour and a half? All right, I'm glad you're here. I'm all done. I'm out of time. I'm out of time, out of time, out of time. Now you want them to walk out in alphabetical order, is that right? <laughs>